afternoon. God bless you. Welcome to my office once again. Good to see you again. So, um, obviously we are on the same topic, forgiveness. I tell you, if you hang in with this, and if you struggled or have struggled with forgiveness, this would really speak to your heart. It would be so beneficial to you that it would and could radically change the way that you forgive or don't forgive. So um, let's go ahead and open up with prayer. And um, I think right now the prayer requests that I have aren't any, actually. Gloria seems to be doing well. Wanda has, uh, is doing well. I have a I have one that I want to pray for. Uh, it's the Garcia family. I can't say much, but um, let's just pray for them and uh, we'll pray for this study. Lord God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Father, we give you glory and honor. We give you praises and thanks, Lord, because you're worthy of our praises. Thank you for you, for who you are, and for all that you are. God, thank you for these studies that we're able to have virtually. Lord, we just pray that you again would speak to hearts and minds and lives. Use your word to transform us into the image of your dear son, Christ. God, I lift up my brother and family, the Garcia family. I pray that you're with them. I pray, God, that you just um, continue to, to call to them, Lord. Give them the capacity to respond to you. And God, I pray that you use that to bring about change in their lives. I pray blessings over them and their whole entire family. And God, you, you hear the cries of their hearts, Lord. I just pray that you again would answer in a way that, that you just bless them, Lord. For your glory, for your namesake. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, God bless you. Virtual hugs. Good to see you again. So let's go ahead and get started in our study. And we talked a little bit about this last week, so I'm kind of uh, picking up there again. We talked about judgment and whether we would be judged for our sins. And I reminded you that your sins had been judged 2,000 years ago. Um, but it also, our sins do have consequences and it demands divine judgment. But stay with me. So if judgment of sin were the last word on the matter, we would all stay trapped in our guilt and brokenness. You feel that? I mean, can you relate to that? I mean, isn't that a true statement that if judgment of sin were the last word on the matter, you and I both will be waddled up in our guilt, in our brokenness. There would be no hope. So praise the Lord. Thank God that judgment is, the, is not the last word on the matter. If vengeance for every offense were the only option, you and I would forever remain separated from our Creator. It, this reminds us that it is God that has come up with this concept of forgiveness in that He forgives us. For sin. It is God that has come up with this concept that we ought to forgive the next person and that we ought to, as believers, that we ought to live a life of forgiveness. I mean, remember last week we talked about don't forget where you came from, don't forget where you were at at one point in your life. And I think that reminds us, man, if it wasn't for God, if it wasn't for God stepping in and drawing us unto himself, 
then first and foremost forgiving us for our sins and then giving us the capacity to forgive others. And I know for some of us, we're still working on that. God is still bringing you to that place. But remember, um, for many of us, man, this is the place where we have to really, really get on our face and cry out. So thank God that he has provided another way, a way, the way, the only way, or forgiveness. Forgiveness does not erase the past. And I think this is probably the third time I've mentioned this throughout the whole series. You know, it's not that, um, you know, we just overlook what has happened to us. It's not that we let people off the hook, but even better, we let ourselves off the hook and we free ourselves. So forgiveness does not erase the past, but it gives us a chance for a better today, right? A better future. And that's the idea. The idea for any Christian is always going to be to move forward. It's to never st uh, stay at a standstill and certainly never moving backward but always moving forward. Um, that is the rector that's used for a church, If that, that a church is always moving forward. If a church is stagnant, if a church is at a standstill, that means it's going backward. Because a church is, is like a living organism, right? And it always ought to be producing. It always ought to be moving forward. And that's the same for an individual who belongs to God, that we ought to always move forward. God desires to forgive. That is his desire. Here's why. Well, you'll see this in a minute, but the, there, I guess I can go, since I said that, I got to tell you, right? Um, you see that in Jesus, and that's all I'll say, because you'll see that in a minute. But the Old Testament contains many examples of God sending punishment for sinful acts. However, his withholding of judgment was for the purpose of bringing the people back to God so that he can forgive them and restore the broken relationship. Now, many Believers and even non-believers and those who call themselves Christian but are really not, uh, we know this scripture, what I'm about to tell you, Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans for you, says the Lord, plan for good and not for hurt, a plan to prosper you. I'm paraphrasing that. But you've heard me say this, and you probably already by now learned by what I've said in the past, that many people take that verse out of context. We want to use it for the good of us, right? For the good of our situation and for the good of our future, you know? God knows the plans that he has for you, plan for good and not for harm, a plan for prosper and not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And all that is fine. But within its context, you remember, you recall that I said this, and it's because the Word says this. You know, God already had passed judgment on the people for their sins of idolatry. Right? Idolatry was turning from the real, true God to false gods. Idolatry is something instead of God. And because they continued, merciful God, they continued and they continued and God, be merciful, tried to call them back through his prophets, through his preachers, so to speak. But they would not listen. So finally God says, judgment. And the judgment that God dished out there in Jeremiah 
and during that time, which was the 6th century, that they would be held captive, that the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar would come in to Jerusalem. And they'll invade Jerusalem and they would take families captive and take them off to Babylon for 70 years. Some of the prophets during that time, and some of the, the, the mediums, the fortune tellers, if you will, were lying to the people and they were prophesying, telling the people, oh, this is only for a time. This is only for a short time. But God told Jeremiah to go tell his people this is not for a short time. Those are false prophecies that the false prophets were prophesizing something that God had not said. And Jeremiah told them that, you know, to go, not only to submit to the Babylonians in their invasion, but to submit into, into them being taken captive into Babylon. And then... God says to tell them to relax, to do life in Babylon, to plant, to, to, to harvest, to have children, give their daughters in marriage and give their sons in marriage. In other words, live life. And, they, and God also said, and pray. Pray for the city of Babylon. Because as you pray for their good, guess what? You too will reap the benefits of the good that comes from Babylon. And God was very specific. This is not in or for the spare of the moment. This will actually take place for 70 years. But after the 70 years is up, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans to prosper you, etc., etc. So this reminds me of that. And remember, just as I had said here, however, uh, God's withholding of judgment was for the purpose of bringing the people back to God so that he can forgive them and restore the broken relationship. So anytime that God was dishing out judgment, anytime that God dishes out judgment for sin, for whatever it is, it is to bring us back to God. It is to, it is to bring us to repentance. God, I'm sorry. God, I blew it. God speaks through situations, through circumstances. Those of you that have been through the curriculum of experiencing God, you see that Henry Blackaby uh, really hammered at, right? God speaks through circumstances. God speaks through his church. God speaks through people. But know this, is that God speaks through circumstances. I tell you, myself as pastor, because I minister to so many people, and so many people come to me and they'll say, you know, I'm experiencing this. You know, nothing seems to be going right in my life. I have to always ask them, where are you at with the Lord? Well, I haven't really been, you can fill in the blank with your imagination. I haven't been you know, with God. I don't, my relationship has been put on the shelf. Hello? Do you think that God is not speaking through this? And what he's saying is, come back. Come back. Just like he did in the days of Jeremiah. And in the days of the prophets. God was using these circumstances to speak to his people. He was using this to be merciful to them because if he chose to, he could have wiped them 
wiped him off the face of the earth. But he didn't. Do our actions, or do our actions rather, they deserve judgment. What God desires is to be gracious, is to be merciful. 2 Chronicles 7.14, most of us know this. If my people, he was speaking to the Hebrew people in the book of Chronicles, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So, God was speaking to the Hebrew people there in Chronicles. But if God was speaking to them, and he was, and if God was putting this condition on them, do you think that it's any different for you and I? No. Are you called his people? If you're a believer, you are. Listen to what he's saying to them then and what he could be saying to you now. Well, if you will humble yourself. What does that mean? If we would humble ourselves. <clears throat> that means that if you would just confess. That if you would just uh, agree with God that uh, he is right and we are wrong. That is what uh, repentance is, right? That is what confession is, is that we agree with God that he is right and we are wrong. And we humbly confess that. We're not too proud to bow down. We're not too proud to get on our faces before God. And then do what? Some of you have learned this in the discipleship curriculum that we go through call the joy call the group right there's a passage there in the call to joy and he's asking us to um, you know what does God require and we are to pick these things out well we are required to uh, humble ourselves we are required to pray in humility. I'm wrong. You're right. We are required to seek God's face. God, hear from me. And of course, that has other connotations. But to really, really do whatever it takes to seek out God. And then... Turn, that means repent, right? Turn, shub in the Hebrew, shub, turn, metanoia in the Greek, turn from their wicked ways. That means have a change of mind about our lifestyle or have a change of mind about the sin that we have been involved in. A real change of mind that leads to a change of heart. And most of you know this. That leads to a change of direction. I've been going down this wrong road. And all I've been doing is hitting a brick wall. Change of direction. And turn from their wicked ways. He says, then, God speaking, right? Then I will hear from heaven. God will hear from his very throne room. And I will heal their land. I will heal them. I will heal whatever brokenness that we, you and I, have been through. Not only you know, in the 
in the BC days before Christ with God's people, but God can also do that today. If he was willing to do it then, is he not willing to do it now? Of course he is. Are you his people? Of course you are. But there's something that we are to do, right? In humility, we are to pray. We are to seek his face. We are to turn from our wicked ways so that he hears us, so that he answers us. Because God desires to forgive. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster, God speaking, I plan to inflict on them. They will turn from their wicked ways. Then I will forgive their, their wickedness and their sin. Jeremiah 36 and 3. As you study scripture, as you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you come to see all the time, I mean always, God was always looking and desiring to forgive the people, his people, to forgive them for their sins. You remember where it all began, right? In Genesis, when Adam and Eve, they blew it for not only them, but for the for humanity. You know, it says that God was walking in the cool of the day. And he says, Adam... <clears throat> In the Hebrew, Adam, 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 where are you? In the King James language, where art thou? In our language today, where are you at, Adam? And the Bible says that he was hiding, that he hid himself. And what was God's question to him? Adam, what have you done? Of course, God knows all. As you saw last week, Sunday, right? He's omniscient. But he wanted to hear from Adam. He wanted Adam to get real with him. He wanted Adam to get to a place of humility, is to confess, agree with the fact that, God, you're right, I'm wrong. God, here I am. I blew it. And he blew it big time. How many sins did it take for Adam to commit for God to consider that sin? One. One time. That was it. One time and one time only. Well, not only, but you get what I mean. That one sin brought sin, plural, into the world. That one sin, singular, brought sin, plural, into the world. And we have been committing this ever since. And what did God do there in the garden? They covered themselves with leaves, with fig leaves. They tried to hide, they tried to cover their sin. But what did God do? God provided them, God's provision. God provided them skin from an animal or fur, if you will, to cover themselves. Their first uh, shedding of blood, if you will, to cover, to atone, if you will, for their sins. I say if you will because that's not um, said verbatim, but it is implicit. It implies that this is what was done. The only way that God could provide skin from an animal or the covering from an animal was to kill the animal. So it's implicit. It implies... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It implies... So God has been desiring to forgive man, humanity, their sins, 
ever since. And forgiveness is only possible, as we concluded last week, through God, through Jesus Christ. The Lord is compassionate, Psalms 103, verses 8 through 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, excuse me, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse or, another word for that would be chide or scold or even nag. I believe the uh, the message uses the word nag. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Isn't that good news? Man, if we were to get what we deserve, you and I would not be here. We would be uh, ex expunged from the face of this earth, we would be gone. We would we would cease to exist. But God's mercy, God's grace, God's compassion it translates into His forgiveness. It says, "For as high as the heavens are above the earth." So great is his love for those who fear him, who revere him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Transgressions is another word for sin, for uh, another word for trespasses. We have, we have. Uh, trespassed against God. We missed the mark of God, right? Because the target really is perfection. The idea, at least in the Greek, the idea is to hit the bullseye. But we fall short of this bullseye. We saw, we, excuse me, we fall short of this of the mark and it, it makes sense because in Romans says that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God we have all fallen short we have all missed that mark but the good news is that God is a merciful God that God is a compassionate God that God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. Have you ever wondered why? How come God didn't say as far as the north is from the south? When I tell you, the east and the west, they never meet. They're infinite. They continue to go and go and go. They're infinite. Not like the north and the south. I mean, so no wonder why God would use those exact words. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That means he just continues. His forgiveness continues and continues and continues. We're out of time. Until next week, God bless you. Let that sink in. That God is a compassionate God. That God doesn't give us what we truly deserve. It's mercy. He's merciful to us. He doesn't give us what we ought to be given, which is death. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But instead, he gives us something else. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let that sink in. I'll see you next. I'll see you on Sunday. 
But in light of this study, I'll see you next week. God bless you. God keep you. Virtual hugs. I hope that this was a blessing to you. If you have not yet subscribed, please do. Hit that bell so you can be notified anytime that there's updates or anytime, any types of notifications. God bless you.